the uses of pessimism. What are the uses of pessimism? Why, why shouldn't we just be optimistic? Uh, I think we should be optimistic about those things where optimism has some kind of foundation. But uh, my the the theme in the book is that a certain kind of optimism, which Schopenhauer called unscrupulous optimism, uh, has a, a grip on the human psyche. Uh, and, one, uh, and it's something which constantly comes back. Uh, this desire to cling to hope uh, when it simplifies the reality. Uh, and there goes with this desire uh, uh, fallacious ways of thinking, ways of thinking which may once have been useful to our species, but which are useful no longer. And those fallacious ways of thinking, I, I believe, have penetrated the culture of the modern world, and uh, they have a kind of dynamic of their own. They're constantly producing new policies, new conclusions, new uh, perspectives on the human world. And the main uses of pessimism is to put an obstacle in the path of those fallacies, to say, stop thinking that there is a solution. Just remember that the best we can do is live with the problem. Yes, you describe a, a, a type of person in your book, the unscrupulous yeah. optimist. Can you, what, what kind of person is that? Well, there are many different kinds of these optimists, but uh, fundamentally it's somebody who, um, when faced with the complexity of the human condition, decides he has to have a solution to it. Um, uh, whereas the, the personality that I would recommend in, pl in the place of that is the, the one who, when faced with the complexity of the human condition, says, yes, the human condition is complex. Um, uh, and, maybe, and there's nothing we can do about it. Or maybe I, well, I can make small adjustments <coughs> at the edges, but I must learn to live with these monsters all around me and try and establish some kind of uh, consensus with them. Can you give a number of examples of these fallacious ways of thinking that the unscrupulous optimist applies and, and okay. some of the disastrous consequences in your view? Uh, in the book I take a, a, a few examples. One uh, which I think is extremely important and has been important here in the Netherlands as well as in England is what I call the born free fallacy. The fallacy of thinking that with Rousseau and people like that, that the human beings are naturally free. Uh, but what one must do is take away all the constraints that are imposed upon them by civilization. Constraints of custom, law, institutions, uh, even uh, things like the curriculum, you know, the, those foundations uh, of the social order which we tend to take for granted. Uh, I think that fallacy is, has been very important in revolutionary movements, very important also in the reforms of education that went on in Europe. Uh, after the can war. you elaborate on that a bit? Yes. So the born free fallacy and education, how, how do they... The, the, the superstition arose during the 50s and 60s that uh, children need to release their inner freedom. Uh, and enjoy them, enjoy that natural curiosity which, the, which children have, and that the idea of a settled, structured curriculum in which you learn things by heart, in which you do maths for half an hour, English for half an hour, Latin for half an hour, and so on, all these things are oppressive, destroying the natural freedom of the child. Really, we want to be releasing that freedom. Therefore, the curriculum has to be opened up, made free, made, made, made non-judgmental. And I think that, has, that was a, a fashionable view which uh, spread through educational practice all over the continent of Europe and I think uh, was very destructive of our intellectual inheritance. Because people are not born free, in your opinion. People become free, and it's a hell of an effort to become free. You become free by, through a long discipline of obedience. That's, what, that's the fundamental uh, thought. Mr. Van Rossum, you've worked almost all your life in education, or large part of your life so far. Uh, do you recognize any, any of these analyses? By yeah, I'm afraid I agree completely with that idea. Uh, Is this the first time in your I, life that you agree I, completely I, with someone? Uh, when it comes to education, I'm, I'm an extremely conservative person, and, and this whole idea that, that, that students, in my case students of course, university students, should be left to their own creative devices, 
is, is not a particularly good idea at all. And, and we had these this small seminar groups where the idea was, of course, of a lively discussion about the wonderful ideas that the students have developed over the week. And the problem is they don't develop wonderful ideas over the week. And, and the whole idea that the, the classical teaching situation where a, a teacher is in front of a group of students that is completely wrong and authoritarian and so forth and so on, I think is, is unjust and, and has created big problems in, in universities. That's very so the, I think what we need in education is uh, much more old-fashioned ideas. We shouldn't go back to the 50s. There must be some golden middle way. I'm always a, a consensus seeker. But, uh, but, but no longer focusing on the idea that Yeah, the and discipline should come back should. into education because yeah. without any discipline, education is, is nothing, actually. Uh, another theme that you describe in your book, another fallacy that you talk about, is, um, is the idea that politics should always be aimed at some kind of utopian end. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Well, uh, actually, I think there's two fallacies there. One is the fallacy that uh, politics should be aimed at an, a utopian end. I think the whole idea of a utopian end is a fallacy. Um, uh, because no utopia has existed. Yeah, exist. I, I, exactly. I, my, my life has been devoted to, cons to building Scrutopia, which is something uh, completely different from utopia, involved, involving uh, accommodation to realities while enjoying them and rising above them. That's, that's something we, we should all do, but, but that's something we do only by renouncing these utopias. But the other fallacy, the more important thing, is the, the idea that, that politics should be defined as a goal-directed activity in the way that, say, engineering is. You know, the engineer has to build a bridge across a particular canal. You know, there is his goal, and here are his materials. He does it by working out the appropriate means to, his, to an end. And that's a, a picture of human rationality, this means ends rationality, which is very important to us. Uh, and much uh, education involves uh, getting people to think in that way. But uh, we make the mistake of transferring that kind of thinking into politics, thinking that the politician too has a goal, the new society, the egalitarian order, or whatever it might be. Um, uh, and he's, uh, he's got various instruments, that's people, and he organizes them uh, in, uh, in order to achieve that goal. But that is probably true now of almost all politics in Western countries. Uh, it, it, politicians talk as though it were true, but of course it cannot be true because it's uh, um, uh, um, an elementary truth about uh, people that when you combine them, uh, you, you cannot predict the result of what their individual decisions will be. That, that most, most things that happen, happen uh, uh, by an invisible hand. That's something which I say, uh, elaborate on in the book. And most things that last are the unintended outcomes of intentions that have long since gone. Can you give one example? Would you, you talk about the European Union, for example. Is that an, is that an example? Or? Yes, it's a very good example of an unintended outcome of good intentions. Um, the intentions were to unite the uh, previous, uh, previously belligerent parties in Europe around a shared uh, strategy for survival and for economic recovery to, to give them a, each of them an interest in each other's success so that they, uh, rather than an envious desire to destroy that success. And it, that was the intention. All kinds of institutions were built up in order to further this intention. Um, but nobody intended what we actually have. Nobody intended an acquis communautaire, which is 180,000 pages long. You know, and so you, all, you believe that is a negative outcome? Well, this is a negative one, yes. Um, but uh, there are th positive outcomes of decisions which don't intend them to. For instance, the British Constitution, and before the New Labour got its hands on it, that was... Um, uh, the unintended outcome of millions of decisions over a thousand years. No, but nobody knows uh, what the British Constitution says, because it doesn't say anything, it's never been written down. Nobody knows what, what it authorizes and what it doesn't. It is completely concealed within procedures, and for that very reason does no damage. Mr. Van Rossum, your latest book is on the dangers of populism. The, the, the title is Why is 
is the citizen angry? Uh, how do you how do you hear this um, analysis of politics as a goal-directed business and the idea of a utopia that can be reached? You write in your book about uh, the dangers of populists presenting utopias to the people, for example. Well, I think the central fallacy of, of, of politics is that, that it is there to make people happy. It, 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 it should solve all kind of practical problems and it should shouldn't have the ambition to make people happy. People have to make themselves happy yeah, if, they, if they're able to do so. But that's not the task of, of politics in, in my view. And it's certainly true that all political movements which promise us paradise in, in what, whatever form have, have had tragic results, really tragic results. And all the countries which have a long, long tradition of, of muddling through in a, in a rather stupid way, uh, uh, falling into the future with with their backs into the future uh, uh, turn out to be quite happy and well organized countries I mean uh, and of course in England there's no constitution at all we have a constitution but most Dutchmen have no idea what's in it so there you have the same effect in a way and and I think the Netherlands is, is typically a, con a country which was, has a long uh, pragmatist consensus tradition and uh, in which the majority of the politicians have never thought that we should create paradise here. Maybe because to some extent in a, in a comparative kind of scheme, the Netherlands is a kind of paradise. Uh, Be, you, most Dutchmen don't realize the fact right. that, that in, in so far as it is possible to organize a a human kind of society. I think some of the smaller Western Euro European countries have been amazingly successful and their inhabitants actually don't realize how successful they have been. Mm -hmm. And the great danger, of course, is that they are trying to make it even more successful with these terrible schemes in which everything is supposed to be turned out even even better than it is. And uh, w one of the, you identify populist movements in Europe in your book as uh, utopian movements. And you, you, f you finish this essay with the uh, call for the people to recognize the imperfectibility of society. Yeah, that's, the, that's the, the final point. Not only the imperfectibility of society, but the imperfectibility man. of man. Because the, the one is, of course, the product of the other. And, and well, this, this whole debate about populism is actually a kind of sub-problem. Because I describe parliamentary democracy, which is the only well-working kind of democracy that we know of. And, but parliamentary democracy at the same time has all kinds of practical problems and frictions and, and things that maybe don't work exactly as people want them to work. And that's where the populists come in and they say, well, this whole parliamentary democracy is all wrong and the thing to have is more clarity and, and all kind of referenda and, and popular leaders by, by a popular, popular consent. And I think that that's an enormous danger, actually. We should keep our... Uh, in a way, an imperfect parliamentary democracy with all the specific problems that it has had uh, since it over the last two centuries. Uh, and, and this dream of having a, a perfect way of managing our politics, which the, the populists uh, sell to their, to their voters, I think, is, is a very dangerous dream. Any, what, what, any dream which leads to, to, to great political changes is dangerous we are more easily uh, reconciled with the fact that things are not perfect on this, on this earth. Well, um, I, I actually, I, I, I don't want to say anything quite as simple as that, um, because I think uh, there are elements of utopianism in every religion, especially when uh, it, the religion takes a millenarian form, as Christianity did, uh, every now and then in the Middle Ages, and Al Qaeda is doing that, uh, and Al Qaeda is as now exactly that you can you can easily turn the uh, the, the normal uh, pious procedures and beliefs of a, a religious believer in a utopian direction. If you promise some kind of salvation that he can achieve here and now in conjunction with his fellows, uh, and um, what I would say is that. 
that uh, it seems to me indubitable that there is a religious need in human beings, how it came about, whether it's a, uh, a social, socially engendered thing or whether it is a, an evolutionary adaptation or whatever you want to say, it is there. Uh, and there must be good ways of managing it as well as bad ways of managing it. And um, I, I think that uh, my own f view is that the Christian way, especially as modified by the Enlightenment, is the right way to manage it. You manage it by uh, removing religion from public life and uh, giving it that, emphasizing the aspect of, of charity uh, and forgiveness which lies at the heart of the Christian message. And that, I think, has done a lot of good in Europe. Uh, it, it, it is interesting that when the millenarian enthusiasms took hold of Europe again, in, it, it was in the French Revolution, and in the 20th century revolutions of the fascist and communist uh, revolutions, all of which were explicitly anti-religious and anti-Christian. Uh, and um, it's when we lost the moderating influence of Christianity that we went mad again. So there's also a danger in ruthless atheism, unscrupulous atheism. Yes. Can you, how, how do you view that, uh, Mr. Ross? Well, I'm an atheist, so, uh, but atheists can be quite normal and friendly and polite uh, uh, citizens of, of any country, in, in my opinion. Uh, having religion as such is no guarantee for, for being an, an attractive or, for, or nice person. I mean, you have your, there are terrible believers and there are very friendly unbelievers, and there are terrible and unbelievers and very friendly believers. It, it, just depends on the person and on the situation. And religion can be a, a, a force for good, and religion, as we all know, if you look at, at his, the history of Christianity, can be a, a terrible force. And to some extent, this whole, this whole idea of realizing a paradise on earth is, is rooted in Christian thinking, in, in the idea that history leads to a final point, to a final conclusion or situation. Look at these fundamentalist Christians in the United States who have really strange ideas about the, the, the coming and, uh, end of history. Right, so this also seems to be a point where the both of you take generally the same view. Well, Mrs. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, over a thousand pages of ruminations would probably differ. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite right to emphasize that, that um, Christian concepts are, um, are still influential in utopian movements in the West, insofar as those utop utopian movements still exist. But uh, I think we should, um, we should give credit to Christianity for, the thing, for many of the things that we've inherited, and in particular for the thing that I think both of us value, which is secular government. You know, and it was this was something which we see from the very beginning in the, the parable of the tribute money, when Christ said, "Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's," uh, meaning to emphasise that the the jurisdiction here on earth is a man-made thing, uh, and the and God's law is obeyed inwardly and with a view to the afterlife, not to, the, to life in this world. Do such traditions also exist in Islam? They don't, uh, uh, and uh, is, Islamic political thinking is unable to recognize the validity of secular law in my, in my reading of it. Uh, it's always regarded as a temporary expedient, uh, making the way for the final, uh, uh, you know, the, the salafa, the final society of followers, in which the law that is obeyed is exactly that which was given by God to Muhammad. Um, therefore, there seems to be a stronger problem of utopianism there's in a Islamic tradition well, there's and Christian a, tradition, in your view. I would say that certainly that, that this, this was um, one of Christ's greatest gifts to humanity, that, uh, that uh, separation of, of, uh, of the religious order from the secular order. Would you like to respond one, one more time no, before we go on to my, architecture? I have a few problems with Christianity in the sense that uh, I think when Christians are in the political majority, as they have been in the Netherlands and up until 1967, that is the first time that they lost their parliamentary majority, um, they have a strong tendency not to have a, 
a, a clear divide between secular government on the one side and the things that the church or the, or the believers want for themselves on the other side. And as when they are in a majority, they have a tendency to force the minority, which is maybe a, exists of non-believers or, or people with different religions, be it Jews or whatever, to force them to live according to their particular rules. Look at the typical Protestant Sunday, which was a, 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 a one of the, the most terrible day in my youth was Sunday. Yeah, but the point the point was it, uh, actually that the difference it was always there was Mr. always Wilson, a, the, a, the point was actually a difference between Islam and Christianity. If you wanted to respond to that, yeah. That is to some extent, is that's true, but that has to do with the development of is Islamic countries and the development of Islam in the 19th century. And Islam has also a long tradition of, of, of pragmatism and, and they have their, their wonderful periods when, when they are when they were rather tolerant. It, it largely depends on the particular situation and, and, and what the leaders of, of, of such a religious movement actually think. And then, of course, all religion, in all religions, there's an enormous difference between the fundamentalists. You've got fundamentalist Jews, you've got fundamentalist Christians, you've got fundamentalist is, uh, uh, believers in the Islam. And, of course, most of the believers are tend to be completely normal people who live their daily lives without any idea that they will realize paradise the next week. In your book also that, that how modernism generally and modern architecture particularly um, has led to the idea of the ongoing development of style and of society having got to be yeah. uh, directed at some kind of aim through architectural Well, I, I, I take the uh, development of architectural modernism as an application of a particular kind of fallacy which um, has uh, is expressed already in the works of Hegel, in Hegel's philosophy of history, but which I think is something much broader, which is, I call it the, um, the moving spirit fallacy, the idea that humanity is caught up in a, in a single linear movement, always taking it in one direction. Uh, and that direction is the direction that we ought to go because it's always leading to greater, greater freedom, greater competence, and so on. Uh, and, uh, of course, it's absolutely true that in the sciences and in, in, in technology, we have, for many hundreds of years, been moving in that direction. But it's a great fallacy to think that the kind of dynamic that, we, that is exemplified by science can be exemplified in something humane, like architecture. Uh, that, that the knowledge required to build properly is knowledge that's as easily lost as one. And, and I think we lost it. Uh, and this goes back to the born free fallacy as well. You know, uh, it's not just in education generally that you need discipline. In art in particular you need discipline. The great towns and cities that were built in Europe were, were the legacy of a very specific discipline. The discipline of the classical orders and the Gothic that preceded them in which architects learned to do things like draw the shadow of the sunlight on a column uh, they learnt how, how different parts of a building fit together and how the junctions of the building have to be moulded in a very complex way in order that the light inhabits the junctions and makes the thing look serene. You know, these are, this is the sort of discipline that was cast away by Gropius and Le Corbusier. And Le Founders of modernism in architecture. Uh, there's some of those, uh, there were great modernists, I don't want to uh, uh, dismiss them, but they cast away that discipline, saying that we didn't need that anymore, it was enough to have a, the pure line and understand the pure line. Uh, and, and why was that, why was that utopian? Why was it an, an unscrupulous optimism? Uh, well, I'm not saying, that the, this then became a movement, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that Although Gropius was clearly quite bonkers, I'm not saying that he was a utopian, but um, out of that grew this, this um, standard propaganda which uh, inhabits the schools of architecture, which says that we can't go back to that because that was then and now is now. We must go on always to something newer. Uh, and you get the sort of the Rem Koolhaas version of, of the architect. The architect is the, the great remaker of the environment. <coughs> the person who's finding yet a, a yet newer way for us to be together in a city and here it is and it all turns out to be uh, gadgets that, that could have been fitted into a modern kitchen 
but, but it amplified, so they, so they obliterate a part of Rotterdam. Uh, and, you know, people may be happy with this, but, it, but whether they are or not, they've never been consulted. Mr. Van Rossum? Uh, I think that modernism, as, a, as an intellectual movement, has been a, a, a terrible thing for all art, not, not only architecture, but also painting and music. Because modernism in its, in its uh, let's say, avant-garde fallacy, that's the idea that, that you have to think up something. As soon as something is established, you have to think up something new. And art is not something that is nice or, or gives you whatever, a warm feeling. Art is something that makes you unhappy in a sense, that, that creates an idea of, oh, I, I don't feel... I don't feel really good or in harmony with the world. It's 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 it has to make you feel uh, inharmonious in a way. So it created painting that nobody is particularly interested in, except for museum. Uh, it created music that nobody wants to listen to, and it created buildings that nobody wants to live in. And that's certainly true. I, I do think that modernism is, is, was a dead end. It, it was also intellectually unavoidable that when people started really serious, started thinking really in a really serious way about art, modernism in a way was unavoidable. But now we know that it's a dead end. It took us about 100 years to find out that it's a complete dead end. And I think that when you look at architecture in the Netherlands, you see there is a kind of traditionalist movement think of, of, of men like Creer and, and others, and people tend to be very critical of these anti-modernist architects, but it's quite evident that that's the future of architecture, and not, not Mr. Kohlhaas, who, who made, you can just built explain. great buildings in Peking, but I mean, it, it, it's, it's of course, I mean... Did it, did Maybe it, not all people in the audience know who von Trier is. Maybe you can just quickly... Creer, the, I mean, the, the name is Creer. He's a Luxemburger. Yeah, sorry. An, an architect from Luxembourg who, who builds traditional houses, uh, the kind of houses that people actually want to live in, because as soon as he has built one of his projects, I mean, people uh, are, are really enthusiastic about it. It's people a new want urbanism to, movement. Is, well, is people it, want to live in the kind of houses that they built in the 20s and in the 30s. I don't know what an erker is in English, but that's what people want. How do you, how do you view this movement of going back to traditional architecture? Yes, I, I'm all in favour of the new urbanism, and uh, I know Leon Creer uh, quite well. Uh, uh, and um, what he does, uh, it, it's absolutely right, it's, it's very popular. Uh, it's hated bitterly by architects. Um, and there's a very good reason for this, because if you build, like, uh, as Creer recommends, you don't make huge profits. Whereas if you build in the Kohlhaas way, you can make two million on every building and have a repair contract, which will uh, bring in 500,000 a year. Right. So it's very profitable to be utopian. That's yeah. perhaps yeah. a nice conclusion.